You would be hard pressed to find more majestic and serene climbs than in a Mississippi forest land. We all know, if not properly managed and protected, what we hold so dearly could easily slip away. This is a worst case scenario. You know, the concept of best management practices means taking those tried and true practices that are field tested and proven to consistently deliver the best results. These best management practices are important because they have been proven to sustain both long-term land value and the environment by reducing erosion and pollution. The loss of just one inch of topsoil reduces the site index five to 10 feet. I've been in the hunting industry for 25 years and I've seen management as good as it gets and as bad as it gets. You know, I've been to the Amazon jungle where they stripped it out, burn it off, and it's just like a moonscape. It's desolate. But I've also been here. I grew up in Mississippi and I've seen some of the best management practices that there are right here in Mississippi. We call them BMPs and following them will help you comply with state and federal laws and help us all avoid government interference in the future, as has already happened in some states. Plus, implementation of BMPs is a requirement of most forest certification programs. We're going to cover some of these BMPs for you today, show you how they work and how to implement them. MFC, by the way, has an excellent handbook on forestry BMPs that goes into far greater detail. Like most things in life, success with BMPs starts with planning. Let's talk pre-harvest planning, since most BMPs deal with harvesting. Communication between all involved parties is critical. The landowner, the logging company, and the forester need to all agree on a plan. Using topographical maps and site surveys, locate any water crossings in areas as ideal as possible. In Mississippi, trails and roads are major areas of concern. Our seasonally heavy rainfall can really make a mess of a poorly constructed road. Take care to locate your haul roads and skid trails carefully to reduce erosion and impact on the land. Streamside Management Zones, or SMZs, preserve a buffer area of trees and vegetation adjacent to waterways like streams, creeks, or ponds that act as a filter. While this is primarily done to protect the waterway from erosion and siltation like this, it also has a number of additional benefits. Part of what we try to teach people in our Adopt-A-Stream program is the importance of keeping the rivers and streams clear. That's where best management practices come in for sure, because having that tr those trees along the river helps keep sediment on the land rather than going in the stream. There's a couple of things that can happen when that, that happens is the silt can go in and cover up the eggs of the fish that are uh, living in the water or it can cover up the uh, macroinvertebrates that are so important for the fish um, to have as food. And also temperature. It doesn't take a much rise in temperature to um, have a negative impact on the fisheries resources that are in the, in the um, stream. So, you know, it's, it's an important thing just for the ecosystem to have all the parts in place um, in our streams, but also for the recreational value of that stream in terms of fishing and outdoor recreations. SMZs provide travel corridors and habitat for game animals, reducing the negative impact of harvesting on your hunting or other wildlife activities. Most of these BMPs are aimed at controlling non-point source pollution, which is defined as being caused by diffuse, non-regulated sources. Do we worry about just your basic runoff from property? No, we have to look at, you know, siltation, you know, what we call non-point source pollutants, something that you can't go out and point your finger at and say, this is where the pollutant's coming from. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about best management practices, is non-point source pollution. We're looking at siltation, or things that could happen as a result of logging operations or agriculture or, or anything like that. Before we get started on specific BMPs, we need to encourage you not only to use these guidelines, but to use them properly. If these structures are not built and implemented according to correct specifications, you'll likely find you get reduced results. 
MFC's BMP manual has specific measurements and charts with illustrations and your forester can help you customize these to your particular land. And this handbook tells you, for instance, how, how to put water bars in, how to put the correct angle in, how far apart to put them, and this has to do with the slope of the land, uh, the type of soil, and uh, you can find that in here and do a good job of putting your water bars in, and this saves, helps save your soil, keep it on, the, on your ground, keep your land more productive. Same way with streamside management zones. Put the proper width of streamside management zone in and do the proper management within the streamside management zone and you will have gone a long ways towards taking care of your land and the water and thereby taking care of the water that goes through your property helps the people downstream. No doubt about it, properly locating and Planning your roads and trails is the most important element of your plan. Scouting and planning can greatly reduce erosion and impact on the environment. Consider where to locate haul roads, landing, skid trails, keeping in mind which will be permanent and which will be abandoned after the harvest. The main road into an area may be a permanent road along a ridge, while skid trails are designed to be returned to their natural state after harvest. There are different methods of handling each type. Regarding roads and trails in general, locate them to serve their intended purpose while controlling surface water and sedimentation. Aerial or satellite photographs and topographical maps are very helpful when designing a transportation network. Avoid hazardous or sensitive areas and problem soils where possible. Establish bank stabilization in all stream crossings. Try to construct your roads and trails during drier periods of weather. Always cross waterways at a right angle, not diagonally. Make your roads wide enough to enhance surface drying. Water bars and turnouts are important structures for controlling water flow and reducing erosion on roads. A raised area is pushed up like a diagonal speed bump. Water bars are designed to divert the water flow off the roadway preferably into a vegetated area that will act as a filter to reduce siltation of waterways. There are specific formulas for determining the spacing and placement of water bars based on the slope, quality of soil, and other factors. There are other guidelines in the MFC's BMP guidebook. When harvesting timber, it is important to remember, keep trees and slash out of waterways. This organic debris can alter the natural temperature and oxygen content of the water, and disturbing the natural flow of the water can lead to increased sedimentation. Remove logging debris from streams. Watch for any pollutants that you might find in the woods, not just candy wrappers or water bottles. Remember, any man-made stuff that you bring into the woods you need to make sure you bring it out of the woods. Equipment breakdowns in the field are going to happen, but take steps to prevent or reduce the amount of fluids that get on the ground, including oil, hydraulic fluid, antifreeze, you know what I'm talking about, especially near bodies of water. Locate your landing or concentration yard where erosion won't be a problem, with a slight slope for drainage. Take steps to prevent drainage from approach roads from entering the landing. Of course, an important part of all of this is water quality, and we are reminded how many water systems impact so many people. Bill Kitchens with the Mississippi Forestry Commission here to talk about that. Well, Scott, today we're up here on the Upper Pearl River, 50, 60 miles from Jackson, and you wouldn't think whatever we do up here in the Upper Pearl River, uh, river basin would affect say the city of Jackson or the water quality in Jackson, but think about where does Jackson get its drinking water from? The Ross Bonnet Reservoir, which is uh, the Pearl River feeds into the reservoir. And what, so whatever we do up here affects the water quality for the state capital. And you would think about logging operations which could put uh, siltation in the river or if we had some kind of spill or something like that, it could put pollutants in the river. All that's going to affect the city of Jackson or any of the other cities downstream. And think about the other water basins or the river systems across the state. 
We have cities that might get their water supply or anything that goes on in the upper part of those streams affects all the cities or other areas downstream. Streamside management zones, or SMZs, are vegetated areas adjacent to streams and watercourses to help protect them from temperature change, sediment, organic debris, and other pollutants. Width of an SMZ is typically determined by the slope of the land, the soil quality, and some other factors. The distance is typically between 30 to 60 feet from each side of a stream. The general guideline in an SMZ is to limit harvesting to leave 50% of crown coverage. Your forester can help you determine location and width of SMZs, which will vary from one area to another. There's more technical information on SMZs in the MFC BMP handbook and from other sources. When working in SMZs, don't travel parallel to the water. Go in and out to reduce the impact on the area. Minimize stream crossing points and only cross perpendicular to the stream. Never block the flow of the stream. Remove logging debris from stream channels. Protect them from chemicals and high intensity site prep burns. Waterways are classified as either perennial streams, intermittent streams, or drains. The guidelines differ for each. For instance, drains do not require an SMZ. However, many of the rules regarding stream crossing and removing debris still apply. There is a list of general guidelines that you can follow for SMZs. We're going to put them on the screen for you here. But remember, you can find them in the MFC's BMP manual and from other sources. Water bars are essential on the stands where we have harvested. Those water bars will help us protect the soil from being eroded away. It will also help us to keep sedimentation from getting into the streams. Also, we use streamside management zone because streamside management zone will also filter out sedimentation. They will provide uh, wildlife corridors for wildlife. It will assist us in maintaining ambient water temperature for the fish and nematodes that might be in the water. But what we're really trying to do here is be sure that generations after us will be able to enjoy some of the same scenes and things that we have enjoyed. Stream crossings present a special challenge. The goal is direct, easy passage across a stream while preserving that waterway's integrity. Consider whether they are to be permanent or temporary. Temporary crossings are to be used only during the harvest period and then removed and returned to pre-harvest state. Temporary bridges or logging mats are preferred, but temporary crossings may also be simple culverts or log crossings as long as it does not disrupt the flow of the water. Permanent crossings are used for ongoing operations throughout the life of the stand. They could be a simple, natural, or paved ford, or a shallow area with a stable stream bottom, a bridge, or a culvert. Permanent crossings should be properly sized for the waterway and the stream bed, slopes, and approach need to be stabilized to reduce erosion. Ideally, it is the landowner who will decide which roads are permanent for all uses, including bridge locations. Site preparation is the treatment of an area to remove undesirable vegetation and logging residues in order to encourage natural seeding or the artificial regeneration of forest trees. Burning, chemical and mechanical methods for preparing a site must consider SMZs and protect them from chemical or mechanical damage or high intensity site prep burns. Avoid extremely hot prescribed burns. They alter the soil's physical properties and consume most of the organic cover. Follow BMP guidelines on constructing fire lines and fire breaks. Mechanical site prep methods such as bulldozing, shear blading, drum chopping, and disking should seek to minimize soil displacement and compaction, minimize soil erosion and sedimentation, and to prevent accumulation of debris in creek bottoms, ponds, streams, or rivers. 
chemical site preparation uses herbicides to remove unwanted vegetation, which can cause very few water quality problems when used correctly. You need to avoid contaminating waterways with herbicides, though. They can damage fish and wildlife. Choose a herbicide registered for the intended use, follow the label instructions, and store chemicals where there is no danger of being spilled or released into the environment. Dispose of herbicides and the containers in accordance with label instructions. Prompt revegetation following site preparation is desirable to effectively control erosion, sedimentation, and nutrient leaching. You need to know who is responsible for doing what. Costs of tree planting and revegetation are a negotiable aspect of the harvest, but you need to determine whose responsibility it is before starting the operation. You should consult a forester to develop professional revegetation recommendations. Grasses, legumes, and other ground control provide fast erosion control and are usually the first line of defense. Proper preparation of your roads, trails, and water crossings, as well as your seed bed, will ensure the best results while minimizing erosion and topsoil loss. Planting erosion control vegetation should be done across the contours of the land. Forest tree seedlings may be planted by hand or by machine for timber production, soil conservation, wildlife habitat, or other objectives. There's more information about this topic in the BMP Handbook and from other sources. Wetland BMPs are a whole category unto themselves. There are federally mandated guidelines for wetlands in Section 404 of the Clean Water Act of 1977. In some cases, a permit is required to work with a wetland area. The program is administered by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in conjunction with the Environmental Protection Agency. Many of our normally voluntary BMPs are mandatory in wetland areas just like this. You have to be especially careful in this sensitive and critical habitat. You can find information on wetland BMPs in the MFC's BMP manual and from other sources. So if you're looking for a, a, a way to really enhance the property, BMP is the way to go. You know, what we're looking for is we want to leave the property that we have now better than we found it. We want our kids and our grandkids to have a place to grow up and enjoy the outdoors. BMPs are just the best way to do the things that you're already doing anyway. Your land will remain viable sustainably and with a little care and effort, we can all continue to enjoy for generations to come this wonderful Mississippi environment. I'm Scott Simmons, and I'll see you out there in Mississippi's forest lands.